It was Friday afternoon, and Jesus is dead. His brutalized body hanging without life on a cross dropped into a hole in the dirt. His executioners had dug the holes, prepared the place, and done their job with ruthless efficiency. This wasn't how it was supposed to be. The hope of mankind overcome by powers of hell, by the shadow of a grave. We once knew what it was like to rule and reign on the earth. We were made to live in the light, in relationship, in purpose. We were made for more than what we've come to accept as normal. Ever since the garden, Satan and his kingdom have been tightening their grip. Darkness has ruled evil, chaos, suffering, hopelessness. We've been enslaved and crippled by the holes the enemy has been digging for us too. But instead of killing the Messiah, the cross became a catalyst for salvation. The hole that was dug to hold an instrument of shame and death was instead filled with an instrument to bring healing and new life. That's the way God is. Nothing is impossible with Him. He's always restoring, always renewing, always able to take what was meant for evil and turn it for good, to take our graves and turn them into gardens. Why? Because He never gave up on His plan. He has never given up on us. He knows what we don't, that you can't have resurrection life without death, Jesus. He died so we can have lives of purpose and power over the grave. He is not dead. He is alive. And because He lives, we can live again.
again. Uh, happy Sunday. Happy Easter to all of you. I hope you are having a fantastic morning so far. I mean, it is Easter morning. It doesn't get much better than that. So I have a question for you. Do you have those moments in life that you will never forget? You know, those, those moments that change things, that change us and that leave us different and, and really never the same again. Maybe like the first time you drove a car. I mean, I remember the first time I ever put my foot on the gas uh, and I stopped within like two seconds and I slammed on the brakes because I was afraid that I was going to, you know, win the Indy 500. I was going so fast. I remember that moment for you is when you graduated high school or proposed to your spouse or got proposed to. Maybe it's when you had, uh, got married or even had kids. But maybe it's other events that you remember. Maybe you were in the military and you remember some of those events, maybe positive and very negative. Maybe you remember in, uh, witnessing the events of 9-11. I mean, I know exactly where I was and what I was doing. Perhaps it was a moment you bought your first house and had, or had to sign all the foreclosure paperwork on the house that you love. Or maybe it was a cancer diagnosis or even the death of a loved one. Moments. We all have a moment or many moments in our lives that we will never, ever forget. Such an event and a moment was the death of Jesus. For many left Jerusalem that weekend and were kind of just left to talk and remember and try to figure out what had just happened to this man they had followed for the last three years. They had soaked up his every word. They had watched him do miracles. They, they saw him raise a dead guy and bring him back to life. They saw him make the lame walk, feed 5,000 people with just five loaves and two fish. They heard him tell incredible stories, parables even. Some were healed, brought back into the community and forgiven. But most of all, they believed that he was the Messiah. But now what? All of that was gone. All of that ended on a hill called Calvary. And Friday came and went. Nothing. Saturday came and went. Silence. Jesus was still in the tomb. What were they supposed to do now? You see, you and I, we know what happened next. We know that on early Sunday morning, two women went to the tomb and they found it empty. We know that these women went back and told the disciples who were still huddling in fear and grief in the upper room. We know the good news. We know that death could not hold Jesus in that tomb. We know about the rock and roll concert that happened early that morning. But some, some still did not. There were some that first Easter who had not heard the good news. There were some still that day who, like many others, didn't understand what happened. Didn't understand or even comprehend what Jesus said when he told them, I will rise in three days. There were some who were just left to talk about what happened on their way back home. Who were just walking down the road once again, left to wonder when God will fulfill the promise that he made to them so long ago. You see, most of the time on Easter morning, we hear the stories of the women, the angels and the disciples. And most of all, we hear about the empty tomb because that's the most important part. It's not often we hear about the other experiences, though, the, the, the others in the story that first Easter morning. Because for some, this day was still filled with much heartache and confusion. But we must never lose sight that Jesus did not come to break hearts, but to make them whole. And he sought to bring clarity and peace, not chaos and destruction. So on this Easter morning, we begin later in the day. This is Luke 24, 13 through 16. Now that same day, again, same day as the resurrection that happened, two of them, which uh, if we think about two of them being uh, other followers of Jesus or even many other disciples that kind of were along the way. So two of them were going to a village called Emmaus 
about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. All right, so we have these two men. They're walking home on the road called or to Emmaus. And one of them was named Cleopas. We don't uh, know what the other guy's name was. And so they were possibly heading home after making this trip for the festival earlier in the week. And it wasn't a long journey, about seven miles or so, but it was long enough to discuss in depthly the events of the past weekend. And I'm sure they were in deep discussion about everything that had happened. I mean, who wouldn't have been? And the original uh, Greek language even suggests that they were in a heated debate as they talked. And I'm sure this debate was surrounding just who Jesus was, what the empty tomb represented and how it affected them as followers of Jesus and fellow Jews. As they were talking, one man came up and began to walk with them, but they didn't recognize him. And I've always wondered how they didn't recognize Jesus. I mean, it's Jesus. How could they not recognize him? I mean, wouldn't they have been happy to see him like right there beside him? But in their defense, others that morning didn't recognize Jesus at first either. Mary didn't know it was Jesus when he came to her in the garden. For we read in John's gospel in uh, chapter 20, 11 through 16. John says, now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. And they asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken away my Lord, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not recognize that it was Jesus. And he asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary, and oh, for her, how sweet those words must have been. And she turned to him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. So even Mary, one of Jesus' followers and friends, closest friends, didn't even recognize him when he was right there in front of her. So we kind of got to give these guys a little bit of slack, right? I mean, perhaps they didn't recognize him because they weren't expecting to see him. I mean, it's not often or okay, never, <laughs> that we anticipate seeing a dead man walking, right? I mean, nobody that day, nobody that day expected no body to be in the tomb. Because when people die, we expect them to stay what? We expect them to stay dead, not walking around saying, hey, peace, how's it going? I mean, I'm fairly certain if I would have been, uh, on that road, I wouldn't have expected to see Jesus either. So their lack of recognition probably wasn't because Jesus disguised himself. I don't think he was in some Halloween costume. I mean, it's possible they just simply couldn't recognize him because they had accepted that he had died and was gone. And they had rejected the idea already that Jesus was the Messiah the second he took his last breath. So maybe they couldn't recognize him because their pain and sense of loss from the events that occurred was overpowering their ability to see God in the midst of life. See, maybe all they could see was the ash heap before them. They couldn't see the new life that was rising above it. Luke 24, 17 through 24, he asked them, he being Jesus, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. And one of them named Cleopas asked, Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? He asks. So the stranger, and I love, I love this 
the scripture and this whole story because it is so, it's so Jesus, right? You know, Jesus asks them what they were discussing and much to their surprise. And, you know, I mean, they are deeply saddened. The scripture suggests they hung their head and paused for a moment before asking the man this question. Like, how could he not know? Now, we need to realize that obviously Jesus knows the answers to the questions that he's asking, right? So why ask a question that he already knows the answer to? Well, in reality, I mean, he was a stranger walking up to these men's conversations. And so he was probably asking them a question to kind of enter into the conversation, much like we do. You know, if you're at a party or a networking mingling thing, which, uh, full disclosure, I do not like those things. Um, introverts, not our idea of a party. Our idea of a party is chilling out at home on our couch reading a book. <laughs> but, you know, anytime you're at one of those kind of gatherings, one of the things that you do is you walk up and you ask somebody a question like, hey, how are you today? Or, or did you see what happened last night on X? Or have you heard about such and such, right? I mean, so that question allows us enter, uh, to enter into that conversation. So that could have perhaps just been what Jesus was doing. He was saying, so what things exactly are you talking about? What has happened recently that causes you to be in such deep discussion with one another? And I think, you know, these two men must have been thinking, are you serious? I mean, have, have you been awake these last few days? I mean, have you spent the last few days in a cave with a rock rolling in front of it? I mean, seriously, dude, what is wrong with you? Because we are discussing Jesus, you know, miracle teacher guy. And, and they go on to describe some of the events that happened last week. But these men are in pain, a lot of pain. Their hearts are crushed. Their hopes and dreams for redemption, for freedom from the Romans was lost when Jesus died on Calvary. What things, he asked them. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death. And they crucified him. But we had hoped, we had hoped he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. They said, we had hoped. We had hoped he was the Messiah. They didn't say our hopes were fulfilled, that Jesus completed his task. Instead, they said, we had hoped and now our hope is gone. Because a dead man can't be the redeemer that Israel needs. You see, the Jewish people, they wanted someone so badly to believe in. They, they, they had hoped that Jesus was the one that could finally end their struggles. And these two men wanted desperately to believe that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. Because in their humanness, they were unable to see God works beyond our human measure beyond our human ideals, even beyond our human understanding and ability to reason. They had hoped he was the Messiah. And when their hope was gone, they did not know what to do. Well, how about you? Have you ever hoped for something? Uh, you hoped something would happen and then it didn't? You know, hoped at this point in life we would be back to normal and in church and you could uh, be celebrating in the gym or the sanctuary smelling those Easter lilies. Had you hoped that things would have turned out differently in that relationship, but it didn't? Have you hoped for something, a path to open up for you and it just it never came? Hoped for a miracle to happen and it feels like it never occurred? healing to come to you or somebody you loved and man it just felt like nothing was there hope hope is waiting for something with the full confidence that whatever you were waiting for would actually happen have you ever hoped for something and it seemed like hope never came these men continued they said, as what is more, it is the third day since all of this took place. So it's helpful to note that three days in the tomb has a lot of significance, according to Jewish custom, because a, a person was not considered dead until three days. And this 
helps us understand and prove that Jesus was dead, like all dead, not just mostly dead, right? He was dead, princess bride, all dead, kind of dead, right? The three days also fulfills the prophecy stating that the Messiah would be crucified, buried, and would rise on the third day. So they continued, in addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen visions of angels who said he was alive. And some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see Jesus. And I love what Jesus said. He said to them, how foolish you are. And how slow to believe that all the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. So Jesus slightly chastises them by saying, how foolish are you? Slow of heart to believe all the prophets that have gone on before. It said, did not the Christ say he must suffer to enter the gates of glory? And this is kind of a crucial statement and an important thought because Jesus time and time again mentioned how he would have to suffer and die in order to fulfill the prophecy, in order to fulfill what God had set in motion long ago. Stranger on the road with these two men, he says the same thing. How foolish you have all been. Didn't I, Jesus himself, say this had to happen in this way? Did he not say that he had to go through all the pain and the suffering and the death in order for the glory to rise from the ashes and be revealed? You see, Friday had to happen in order for Sunday to be glorious. Don't you remember what was said? Have you not heard that though the sorrow may last for the night? Joy. And resurrection come in the morning. So after a short rebuke of these two men, Jesus continued on with them and explained the scriptures of the prophets and of Moses, those ancient words that concerned himself. He gave them the best teaching lesson anyone could receive. Like a personal one-on-two teaching lesson. I mean, that's amazing. And he began to teach them of the wonders of the prophets. And the connection the scriptures of old had with the occurrences in Jerusalem these last few days. He bridged the gap for these two men that day. Luke 24, 28 through 35. As they approached the village to where they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, stay with us for it is nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took the bread and he gave thanks. He broke it and he began to give it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And then he disappeared from their sight. I mean, how awesome is this? Jesus sits down to eat dinner with these two men, and it's when he breaks the bread and blesses it and gives it to them that they finally see it. They finally recognize. And every time I read this part of the scripture, I get chills. Because, oh, to be there in that moment, that moment where they were still in agony and in sorrow and in deep grief over the loss of Jesus. And it finally dawns on them that he had been with them the whole time. Luke said these men recognized him in this moment. And this isn't a passing recognition like, oh, I know who you are. But this is a deep understanding. And the Greek word that Luke used was epigenosko, which means to know thoroughly. The root of the word genosko is an intimate knowledge of someone, not just a surface level knowledge, not the I have a thousand friends on Facebook kind of knowledge, but rather I know you deeply, fully, and intimately. 
Luke was saying in this moment, these men didn't just know who Jesus was. They saw him and they knew him intimately in a deep way that changed who they were. And this is also an interesting twist to our story. This was not Jesus' home. He would not have been the person to bless and break the bread. This is the responsibility of the host or the father of the house. Sorry, my papers are stuck together. But Jesus, however, he took the opportunity to reveal who he was. He takes the opportunity, one, which he asked his followers to remember from now on, to show these two desperate men that indeed joy had come in the morning. And he was alive. William Barclay, in his commentary on Luke, he said, it was at an ordinary meal in an ordinary house when an ordinary loaf was being divided, that these men recognized Jesus. It was an ordinary meal in an ordinary house with an ordinary loaf that was divided, that these men experienced and recognized the extraordinary man who was Jesus. There was nothing fancy about the meal, just a meal with the guests, but this meal, as ordinary it was, was extraordinary because these two sat in the presence of the risen and living Messiah. In what must have been a very poignant moment, Jesus is revealed, or better yet, Jesus is remembered in the blessing and in the partaking of the bread. Remember me every time you eat of it, he said. And these two remembered and recognized and understood. Jesus, the one they saw crucified, was now standing before them, and they were overjoyed. These ordinary yet very sacred moments of the blessing and breaking of the bread, their eyes are open to the truth and the joy of the resurrection. And I love this thought. In this very ordinary moment that night, the extraordinary happened. That is definitely a good reminder for us that even during perhaps our still very somewhat ordinary days of not doing a whole lot still in the midst of the pandemic, that extraordinary things can happen. And not only can the extraordinary happen in our life, but that moment can change our lives forever. These two men are stunned because they finally see and not only do they see, but they understand. They finally get that Jesus fulfilled the promise of the scriptures. They get that who they had been with all day was the one they had longed to see once again. And then in an instant, he disappears. And then they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking with us on the road and opened the scriptures to see us? Luke continues, they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. They found the 11 and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true, the Lord has risen and he has appeared to Simon. And then the two told of what happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized them when he broke the bread. Oh, the joy they experienced from that incredible teaching of a stranger on the road to the glorious meal they ate with their teacher, their Lord and their risen Messiah. It seems almost immediately we read that they left for Jerusalem to tell the others what happened, that Jesus was indeed alive. It wasn't just a myth. It wasn't just a legend. It wasn't just a rumor or a story some people were telling. It was the truth. They traveled back to Jerusalem on the same road they walked on in sorrow, dejected, and mourning. Now they ran, or at least traveled as fast as they could, back to Jerusalem with joy in their hearts knowing that Jesus was alive and confirming their hope that had now returned, that he was the Messiah. That moment on Good Friday changed the disciples, changed these men. Three days later, that moment in the upper room when Jesus broke the bread changed their hearts forever. I guarantee their lives were never, ever the same after that encounter with Jesus. I guarantee they were never the same people. 
I guarantee that later in life they could tell you the exact moment what they were doing when they were sit where they were sitting or where they were standing that night. I guarantee they could have even told you what time of day it was when they recognized Jesus. This moment left a lasting mark on them for the rest of their days. That is the glory and the beauty of the resurrection. When we encounter the resurrected living Jesus, our lives are never, ever the same. These men went from the end of the world despair to a dead sprint for seven miles because the hope and joy was back in their hearts. There are so many moments in life that change us, that impact us, that force us to see the world differently. The resurrection, Easter morning, is one of those moments. The resurrection changes things. It transforms things. And because of the resurrection, our lives as followers of Jesus will never, ever be the same. Because as we've been talking through these last few weeks of Lent, because of the resurrection, you and I can rise up from the ashes of defeat. Because the resurrected King has resurrected you and me. Because he is the resurrection and the life. You see, because of Jesus, we are never, ever the same. When we experience the grace and love of God like these two men did that night, and I guarantee you, life will never look the same. And I've said this lots. I guarantee, guarantee with everything I am, that you and I cannot come face to face with the unconditional love and grace of Jesus and not be changed in some capacity. We cannot experience the hope that is found in a risen Savior and not have our perspectives altered. So I pray on this Easter morning that you soak in and bask in the joy of the empty tomb. I pray you hear the words, he is not here, he is indeed risen. And I hope you see the best is yet to come. Because Jesus waltzed, danced and boogied his way out of that tomb. Finally, I pray your life is never the same because of Jesus and because of the resurrection that lifts you into new opportunities and new life. So these two were just ordinary men walking home on the road to Emmaus, but they experienced the extraordinary presence of Jesus, the risen Savior. May we on this morning experience the extraordinary presence of the risen Christ wherever we are at. And may our eyes be opened so we can recognize Jesus for who he truly is, the Son of God. And may we not be blinded by our circumstances, by our sorrows, by our pain, but remain hopeful, remain faithful because of the promise of the King who said, just hold on because I'm coming back. Christ the Lord is risen today. He's turned graves into gardens and the resurrected King, the living hope, is actively working on resurrecting you and me. Amen and amen. Let's pray. God, on this Easter morning, we celebrate you. We celebrate the extraordinary moment where you danced out of that tomb. For we know in that moment where you experienced resurrection, that you came alongside us and are giving that same moment of new life and resurrection from our own ashes of defeat. Lord, I pray 
I pray that the Holy Spirit moves in each one of our hearts this morning, in our homes, in our cars, or wherever we are at. And I pray that it just weaves through us to help us see and experience your grace and your love in a way that we never thought possible. Father, give us the strength. And the ability to see the hope that has come. Help us to be the resurrected people that you have lifted up from the ashes and given new life and new opportunities. Jesus, we celebrate you, our resurrected King. And it is in your holy and awesome name that everybody said, Amen.
an incredible rest of your Easter uh, Sunday morning. And if you've got some peeps laying around your house, uh, make sure you gobble them up and think of me when you eat them. It's kind of weird to say, but you know what I mean. And if you have peeps laying around your house and you can't stand them, uh, just feel free to drop them off at my house and I will take care of them for you. Uh, but make sure you tell your people peeps how much they are indeed loved because uh, we all should hear that uh, and remind them that he is not here because he is risen and in his resurrection we are also given new life and new opportunities now go in the grace and the love of our lord jesus christ the resurrected king and may you see and believe he is resurrecting you from your own ashes of defeat. Amen and amen. Have a happy Easter and I will see you right here next Sunday at 11 a.m. on Facebook and YouTube. So follow us and like us and share and all that good stuff. So most importantly, happy Easter. Amen and I'll see you later. Bye.